All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think there, I was told there were about 15 of you out, 19 now out in Zoom land, and there are two, four, six, about 10 of us here in the room. So welcome to the March 4th edition of the RAS Halifax Center members meeting. I'm Judy Black, one of the directors here at the center, and I'm also your MC for this particular meeting. If you have any feedback at all for any of the members of the board to consider as to how we can enhance this experience and perhaps even make suggestions as to who we can have address or even a topic to address uh, in the future meeting, please let us know. As you can see from behind me, John Angreaves is our current president and he can be reached at president at halifax.rask.ca. Excuse me, if you wish to reach anyone else on the board, be it our EPO, our, which is our education public outreach, our observing chair, the secretary, the treasurer, please go to contact us on our website and you can certainly find the correct email address to um, contact them there. Also, this particular meeting, if you have to pop out for any reason partway through, it will be posted on our REST, uh, YouTube site. And as well, any previous meetings are there as well, as well as some other special presentations that we have. Thanks. The first thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge the Indigenous lands. We are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We would also like to acknowledge the fact that RASC and the Halifax Center do believe in and practice inclusivity and diversity. All are welcomed regardless of age, <clears throat> excuse me, disability, gender, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, ethnic origin, color, nationality, national origin, religion or belief, or sex or sexual orientation. We are opposed to all forms of unlawful and unfair discrimination. We also want members to, to know that should there be any discrimination or harassment at or consequent to any of our Halifax RASC uh, events, or meetings, be it in person or in cyberspace, that you report it to a board member. It's unexcusable and we have zero tolerance for such behavior. So here is our agenda. So again, welcome to everyone. Um, are there any new members in the room here with us today? Ah, we've got one new one, yay. Welcome. Uh, how about on Zoom land? And people here will have to let me know. Are there any new members out there in Zoom land? No one's identifying themselves. Okay, great. How about guests, people that aren't members but are here because what we've posted on our website is sounds intriguing and they'd like to learn more. Oh, well, welcome uh, out there in Zoom land. Hopefully, if you have any questions, you can contact us. Ah, hi, Don. Welcome. And I'm sorry, I've forgotten first name. Hi, Jeff. So we've got Jeff here and Don out in Zoom. And so welcome to you both for attending. Um, once I've done the welcome, David Hoskin will be up first with the photo montage. And this is a collection of the photos that were taken by our members on various sources. Uh, then we have our first guest for today, uh, Stefan Picard from New Brunswick Center. Thanks to Lisa Ann for suggesting that Stefan join us today. Uh, and he will address astrotourism, which is a, a sort of a whole new industry that he will introduce us to. So we have a 15 minutes introducing new to this meeting. In meetings past, we've always had, before COVID, I might add, we had about a 30 minute break partway through the meeting so the members could have a chance to socialize. Now, recognizing that we've got two groups of individuals, um, the ones in the room can socialize here, the ones out in Zoom land can do what we used to do when we had Zoom only meetings, which is you can chat amongst yourselves, so to speak. Uh, it will be non-recorded, by the way. We will turn the recording off so that your comments and whatnot out in Zoom land will not be recorded during that break. Then we have our second speaker, Chris Young, who's here from Halifax, 
and he has a really intriguing presentation today on the Andean farmers forecast. Um, I won't say much more for now, but we'll, we'll explain that more. And then David will be back up on the floor with the what's up in the March skies to let us know what to look for in the coming month. And then Pat Kelly from out there in Zoomland will provide the uh, board notes. So any questions? With no questions, um, David, um, floor is yours. Hey, um, so first we're busy with our cameras. Uh, in uh, February, I guess we had a, a little better weather. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all right. No, no, not hard to beat January. Um, so this is a little longer presentation. Okay. Are we good? Okay, good. Yeah, now we're working. Um, okay, so uh, Jerry Black uh, posted a couple of nice pictures, uh, really nice shots. Uh, Tadpole Nebula in this one, I see four. No, I can go back. Okay. Yeah, that worked. All right. Uh, Jerry's second was the uh, Flaming Star Nebula, I see four well, five. And the Rosette Nebula. This is a popular target. There are a few people uh, who are imaging the Rosette this past month. Uh, Michael Boschat, uh, is he taking pictures from his uh, window? Uh, this is uh, some sunspots he caught uh, in white light. Sun's getting quite uh, quite spotty these days. And uh, Michael's been uh, having fun with his. Um, new uh, ASI 120 mono camera. Um, so he's taking some close-ups and, and I believe he's using his uh, new Russian 75 millimeter telescope for these, uh, which uh, it, it sounds like he had quite a bit of fun getting it uh, into the country. Uh, Michael also got a nice shot of uh, Jupiter, Moon and Venus on the 22nd of February. And you can see uh, he caught Earth shine quite nicely in the uh, crescent moon. And uh, he also was able to uh, get an image of our old friend Comet ZTF, and uh, which see it, but it's right here, and uh, Mars up in the upper uh, right corner. And that was on the 11th of February. Uh, Milky Way season is uh, approaching us. If you're uh, willing to get up, uh, really early in the morning, uh, Barry Burgess uh, got this shot on the 26th of February. Uh, Dave Chapman uh, used VGO to image uh, Comet ZTF on the 12th of February. And uh, making us all jealous, uh, Dave also posted this shot of uh, the Jupiter moon and Venus. Uh, you can see the palm trees, so that wasn't from Halifax. That was uh, while well, on his vacation in Cuba. A really nice shot there. Alerted that he may get several emails now because he's showing <laughs> palm trees. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right. He was uh, banned from palm trees, right? Uh, Jason Dane, uh, out early in the morning to uh, catch the uh, Milky Way rising. You can see uh, uh, Sagittarius, and, and uh, I think you can see Antares there in the uh, upper right corner. I went to uh, get this is one of the beaches. I forget which one it was that he goes down to. Uh, Jason also has been uh, busy imaging planetary nebula. Uh, so this is a very interesting shot. I don't think I've ever seen uh, uh, these two nebulae before. Uh, HGF1 and Abel 6, uh, both of which are planetary nebulae. Nice uh, bubble and well, actually both of them. You can see, I think you can see a shock wave uh, in the uh, in the middle coming off that nebula. <laughs> and uh, Jason uh, also took advantage of uh, Orion's uh, prominence in the sky to image the uh, Orion Nebula and the Running Man Nebula. And last but not least, Bernard Bloop, um, another target in uh, uh, near the uh, area of Orion. And you can also see the flame and the uh, 
flaming bush and the horse head uh, nebula there, and also the Orion nebula. So this is a nice wide angle shot. I think peeking up there just under Bernard's loop is uh, M78. So lots of lots of good targets in that image. Uh, Jeff Donaldson uh, got this nice shot of uh, on the 12th of February of Comet ZTF, and, and uh, he really caught the uh, the nice uh, green hue due to the uh, ultraviolet excitation of uh, diatomic uh, carbon. Uh, Tim Doucette uh, took this image of Comet ZTF. And uh, also the Rosette Nebula. So like I said, it was a popular target this month. Uh, I think this particular image, Tim uh, noted that it only took two hours because he was using his 14-inch uh, uh, schmidt cassie ring with a Hyperstar. So and he's also complained he's running out of things to image because the image is so quickly now <laughs> the Hyperstar. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, Sombrero Galaxy, Messier 104, also from uh, Tim Doucette. You can really see the nice, uh, nice dust line there. Uh, Lisa Ann Fanning um, took this uh, shot of the uh, Jupiter Venus conjunction on the 26th of uh, February. Looks like she used her, her uh, cell phone for this one. And uh, Jeffrey Fla uh, Franklin uh, took this image of the uh, moon on the 28th of February. Paul Gray uh, also looked at the Rosette Nebula. Got this nice image. Dark color is quite nice there. And also a small galaxy, NGC 2903. Uh, Bruce Hamilton, uh, oh, this is coming out as well as it should. Uh, this is really, he, he titled this Jupiter and Venus in zodiacal light. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's the uh, triangle of so next is, uh, zodiacal light is, is uh, coming up there. and uh, of course, uh, because the planets are in the ecliptic, uh, Venus and Jupiter are smack dab in the middle of it. Uh, I imaged the uh, sun uh, this month on the 15th of February in white light on the left and hydrogen alpha on the right. And also the moon on the 2nd of February. And the beehive cluster, uh, Messier 44. I think I did that uh, later in the month. Lots of nice uh, hot young blue stars and, and a few uh, older yellow stars. Uh, and uh, I also had a shot at uh, Comet ZTF and Mars on the 12th of February. Oh, where's the Right there. What's the dream? <laughs> it's tiny. It's not, not as big as it used to be. Uh, and this was uh, my uh, version of Jupiter, Venus, and the uh, new crescent moon on the 22nd of February. I, I took this in uh, in New Brunswick in uh, o'clock, and it was cold <laughs> and icy everywhere. So uh, I just used a, a DSLR and a tripod. It didn't uh, drag out any of my telescope. And uh, the... Uh, what's the Craters uh, the other night along the Terminator, and uh, uh, Dave Chapman noted that uh, you can see the crater walls that are responsible for the Lunar X and the V, but uh, it, uh, I, I took this a little too late to actually uh, catch the sunlight uh, just lighting up the, the tops of those craters. But I think you can, I can kind of see them here. That's the X. Nope. Farther down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So you're here, Judy? That's it? Yeah. What can I know? Oh, this. Yeah. Judy, you, you've got better eyes. I'm, 
all I'm seeing are pixels. Right. Okay. Oh, there. All right. Good. <laughs> and Pat Kelly, uh, also a nice shot of Jupiter, the Moon, and Venus on the twenty from the graveyard. Yes. Right. <laughs> I think he said. And Garland Crane on the twelfth of February. Uh, he uh, he was he just happened to look up and and have a camera and and grabbed it. Well, well I guess he got it with his uh, iPhone camera. I was out imaging and I looked up and saw them coming over, but I, I didn't have anything pointed in that direction. It was pretty impressive though; they were really bright. Uh, Blair McDonald, uh, Tadpole Nebula. Uh, Gaurav Singh, uh, this is a really nice shot of uh, Comet ZTF and Mars on the 10th of February, and you can see Mars, uh, lots of depths uh, in the background there. And I don't know if everyone, anyone can see, but there's another comet up in the top, there's a uh, far away distant comet uh, in the uh, Top left. This is a wider uh, field of the same thing, and and uh, he captured um, well the Hyades are there in Aldebaran, and also the Pleiades. Uh, Brian Smith uh, took this image of Comet ZTF on the fourth of February, and uh, as you can you can see the depth tail. But also the ion tail uh, showing up quite nicely. And uh, lastly, Kathy Walker. Uh, it's been uh, busy. I, I guess she got the ice off her observatory so that she could get it open. Uh, so uh, the Orion Nebula, and that's the A42. Uh, a galaxy, NGC 2903. And that's it. Thanks so much, Dave. And you were right, there were a lot of astroimagers this past month. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, have clear skies this month and maybe have a, another crop of uh, equally impressive images. So as you can see, next on our agenda is our first guest speaker from um, New Brunswick Center, uh, Stefan Picard. And again, my thanks to Lisa Ann for recommending Stefan to address uh, our center she has heard him speak in other um, presentations. Stefan rediscovered his passion for astronomy after a hiatus of almost 20 years. Um, and he rediscovered it after the co or at the start of the COVID um, pandemic, as many of us certainly um, increased our interest in the night skies as well. Throughout the lockdown, she began dabbling in astrophotography. As the need for equipment increased, as one can appreciate, so did the expenses. And this led to consider using his passion for the hobby to generate some revenue to afford the ever increasing investment level. With 25 years experience in business and in marketing, this venture became known as Cliff Valley Astronomy, which he launched in early April, 2022. Initially offering private star parties for small groups, it was understood that astrotourism would be an important aspect of business to develop. Its first year has proven successful on the supporting or a surprising strength of private star parties bookings. This has allowed to reinvest and prepare astrotourism services set to launch next month. His biggest endeavor currently involves creating a destination event coincided with the most important astronomical event in over 50 years. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Stefan and he can explain about astrotourism and the increasing need for it. Stefan, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm just going to get my uh, screen up here uh, real quick, but the uh, bar, the Zoom bar is in the way of my, <laughs> oh, there we go. Apologies for that. Okay. Does everyone see my screen? Yep, you're good. <laughs> yeah, you see the, the slideshow itself? On Zoom, we see it. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yep. I think they we don't, don't see it in the room yet, Stefan. So just hold on for a moment, please. Yeah, no problem. I'll I'll take the time to uh, to thank you, uh, Judy, John, for uh, 
following through on the uh, request for invite by Lisa and uh, glad to be here today to present to your center and everybody else joining us. Um, I can't be thankful enough for Lisa. Aside from this, she's been very, very supportive and a great friend in this uh, journey as a astro entrepreneur. She's, uh, she's heard me uh, bounce crazy ideas, gripe, and she's helped been very helpful on so many fronts. So thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate everything you do for me. Go ahead, Stefan. We've got your presentation up now. Perfect. So uh, before we start, also, if uh, anybody has questions, let's throw in the chat and we'll address it at the end because I can be long winded and I'm going to try and mill through this um, presentation as quickly as possible. So as Judy outlined, I started this as a uh, way to create more money. There was too many things going on. I was getting the big fever of astrophotography. I love to travel. I didn't want to give up to, you know, I, in the past eight months, I've done Vegas, New York, we're about to go to Costa Rica. So there's been a little, a little bit of financial pressure. So that was the, uh, the key driver for me starting uh, Cliff Valley Astronomy. And uh, it first started with a uh, private star parties, but I knew I was going to dive into astrotourism because uh, as a marketer by nature, I, I knew there was a need and uh, there is demand out there. So what's the difference between astronomy and astrotourism? Well, astronomy, we all know that it's looking at celestial objects beyond the horizon. Quick uh definition there astrotourism is actually creating opportunities while visiting new locations and creating an experience by incorporating one or more elements of astronomy or something related to astronomy um what are the types of astrotourists well there and i'll i'll preface this to uh you You'll notice that this presentation and this conversation will be very much more geared on the business side, like marketing, rather than our hobby for astronomy. But it's marrying both, which I have uh, fortunately a, a good foothold in both. So, uh, so if you know this might be a dry presentation for certain people, but I'd love any well any comments or any questions at the end. So explorers are like us, people that have a really high interest and really high passion for astronomy as, as a hobby or a science, you know? And then uh, when we dive into other segments of astrotourists, the inquisitors are more the people that have a, um, for example, I have friends that are, do phenomenal astrophotography, just like the amazing pictures we just seen. Uh, he'll put up a nebula, but like, spent hours on it and he'll get maybe 30 40 likes and then he'll put up one of the moon and then all of a sudden he's got like a thousand likes <laughs> why well some people have those they look at the they don't look at celestial objects the way we do because they're either more spirit, spiritual or you know they have different me meanings around what is in the sky and i hate to sort of bring out sub niche segments of this category as uh, astrologists. Listen, we, we all get the joke. We get called by accident by people who don't know better. They call us, astro uh, uh, they, they say we do astrology and we like, you know, get miffed a little bit, but you know, uh, or people that have uh, a little bit more of a fringe uh, um, uh, interest in UFOs and so forth or the occult so you know it's a little bit of a different thing but that's just the people that have uh, a keen interest but it's not more related to science or anything else and then you got collectors which are usually uh, astrophotographers uh, and nightscape photography some do it for capturing the object and when you get like people that love to take milky way shots or nightscape photography it's collecting the the place they're in you know uh we just saw some great pictures uh of the milky way one uh, arching around the tree one at the beach and all that so so these are the type of individuals that are fall into this uh category and then you got the socializers that are by example usually families or groups of people that travel together 
and and they experience or have a new newly found love for the night sky. Uh, typically, what we find there, it's uh, it's more broad in the general population, and they're usually people that reside uh, in or near urban centers and don't get to see the night sky like we do uh, when we get away to a dark sky site. So, why is that uh, coming back to uh, the uh, last category? Is We've lost that feeling, a little bit of a note to the, uh, we lost that loving feeling. Uh, within three generations, we've lost our intimate relationship with the night sky. Uh, currently, about 80% of the population cannot see the Milky Way from where they live. Major centers have to travel, I'm talking big cities, like Halifax would probably be the one that would start falling in that category. They had to travel at least an hour to get decent dark skies to be able to appreciate uh, the night sky. Uh, actually, through a lot of research and all that, uh, came across some interesting figures that uh, most people 40 years of age or younger uh, do not recognize anything or know what it is in the night sky beyond the moon and the sun, which is kind of sad. Like, I still run into people that call Venus the morning star, you know, just as an example, or uh, those types of things. So um, also, most people don't understand the time relevance of the uh, celestial events. You know, we base our knowledge of time on a day is the earth rotating, the year is going around the sun, uh, you know, the, the phases of the moon, also the uh, monthly phases of the moon, like our ancestors uh, used to rely it on when to plant their harvest, when to harvest, um, when to go hunting, and so forth. So this is all beyond our tight-knit community of astronomers. It is not known as a, as a understanding in the wider population. Um, and also, uh, one other thing, too, I uh, when I do my star parties, I show people how to find Polaris. They don't know that anymore. And they don't know how to use the night sky like uh, our ancestors used to do for whether it was sailors or even uh, hunters or people that would travel uh, across, uh, uh, you know, when they were discovering North America and all that. The, the, the knowledge of the night sky was there because it was essential for a number of things, including survival. So that lack of knowledge offers a lot of opportunities you know uh, it, this is where we can uh, either as a, uh, a community whether it's a, a RAS uh, center or a local uh, astronomy club or anything like that you can help and educate which we're already doing right but uh, coming down to the business side as tourism uh, side of things, just a little bit of sharing that knowledge creates an experience where you'll find a lot of people will see value. And if they see value in a lot of times, they'll be willing to depart with a few dollars. So uh, we're going to get into uh, more into that. But um, and also creating a, a movement in the region like I, I, I'll pick on Southwest Nova Scotia with everything that's happening down there from a uh, astrotourism related uh, uh, aspect, you know, uh, when the community gets really involved, some really neat things start happening. And, you know, I, 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 I see also astrotourism being the lead uh... Oops, sorry, there was somebody at the door. Um, uh, you know, creating uh, some other uh, spinoffs that can create either opportunities in tourism and hospitality, um, ed uh, education wise or research uh, side of things. So, uh, so, you know, it takes that linchpin to really take a uh, toehold and then, you know, it can grow from there. And, and it takes very little to uh, create positive emotional reactions, which is, uh, when I first started the, the business, uh, not even a year ago, I did a free uh, public viewing of just the moon here at the Quispam Sis Town Hall. And, uh, you know, it was 
quite busy. There was kids. There was uh, about 30 in the, uh, people around and, you know, I'm answering questions and all that. And um, all of a sudden there was this uh, gentleman, he must have been in his 60s. And uh, you know, people are usually given a very quick reaction. Oh, that's cool. Or that's crazy and all that. But he was being very quiet. And I, he he was at the eyepiece for about 30 seconds. And I was, I could see like he, he was, you know, being like very quiet. But I approached him and he was tearing up. He said, in my, all my life, I've never seen the moon like that. And I was like, oh. You know, that was quite the uh, very surprising and very uh, revealing to me. So how some people, it doesn't take much to create that type of emotion. So so this is all conducive to me leading into when, you know, from a marketing standpoint and trying to understand people, what drives people to go through to astroturism and what you can offer. You got to understand the consumer behavior. And these are all things that I've picked up over uh, recent months that helped me give an understanding of what uh, the potential and the opportunities are. So, you know, we all know this, what do they love to see? Of course, they love to see the moon. And, you know, it's when, you know, uh, usually uh, having just gone through uh, quite a busy time for star parties, uh, Jupiter and Saturn and the IPs just, you know, that's they're like the showstoppers a bit. And, you know, the more in depth, you, you know, there's opportunities for naked eye stuff, uh, meteor showers and, you know, the constellations and all that. And just a little bit of information about that. People will walk away and really appreciate uh, what they've got to experience, whether you captured them for a couple minutes or they're visiting a astro tourism operator and they're spending a weekend and, you know, it makes for, uh, memorable stuff that this is all where uh, uh, tourism as an industry is gone. It's all about the experience. So why astro tourism now? Well, it's sexy again for a number of reasons. The uh, the pandemic, as we all know, uh, drove a lot of people into astronomy because they couldn't go anywhere and they had some residual dollars that would usually spend on traveling or various things that now that say, well, let's get a telescope, you know, let's do something with the kids. They don't know what to do with themselves. So, uh, and also I, I called the SpaceX James Webb factor, you know, it's, there's just such a neat level right now of where uh, space exploration and, and the research and the, the amazing technology that's being used that usually leads into uh, mainstream media and also the social media uh, things, you know, Instagram factor. It's it's amazing when you see pictures like we just saw at the start of today's um, session, uh, you know, it, people are sharing it. It's reaching around the world within a few clicks. And, you know, it's just that hat plays a big factor in people having all of a sudden an interest on what's going on uh, up there. Uh, they also, uh, the levels of interest are high, even for the people that are what we would call newcomers to the uh, the hobby, all the way to the um, more seasoned people. Again, I'll pick on the astrophotographers with the technology that we have in our hands right now. And again, going through this slideshow of pictures we saw earlier, it, it, there's just so much potential in, in being creative and you know, sharing this with uh, people, uh, whether it's our close circle of friends or, you know, getting it uh, uh, shared again on social media or on other media players and so forth. Also, the new economy is really driven by services and knowledge. And, and you know, I, I, I live near St. John and there's always been this, as a blue collar town, they associate growth as stuff leaving in trucks for markets, right? The, the, the old bricks and mortars type of industry um, philosophy where a lot of the, the economy now is in buildings that you don't see what's coming out. It's, it's professional services and all that. So when you look at astronomy, uh, it's very much a knowledge-based hobby. And now with the, turning it into a astrotourism opportunity, that will come to that as well. So it's all about the experience. 
what are the key drivers for astroturism? Uh, we're well familiar with all the uh, the RAS certified dark sky sites, the Starlight Foundation, the IDA, and all that. So when you have that designation, that's uh, actually quite a uh, a good um, tourism asset to put out there because then it it gives legitimacy to the area. And like in New Brunswick, we've got four. Uh, we got the uh, uh, Mount Carlton Provincial Park, Kuchibukwak, and uh, um, Fundy National Park that are dark sky preserves. And then we got the Urban Star Park in St. John. But I come from Northwestern Brunswick. I've traveled with my day job around this province quite a bit. We could easily have 10 designated dark sky sites. So is there a lot of opportunity? Yes, obviously. And the same as with Nova Scotia, you got some great uh, recognize uh, dark sky sites down there too, but I'm sure there's many more that could areas that could get that. Um, daytime activities and uh, attraction. Well, a lot of tourism is driven by what's happening during the day. People are going to the beach uh, in the winter. They're going snowshoeing, skiing, and all this and that. But what do they do at night if they're traveling for this reason? Here's one way to capture them. Other than, you know, if you rent a cottage, you go and snowmobile for six, seven hours, and then you get back, and what are you going to do? Sit by the fire pit and have a beer, and, you know, that's your night? Well, now there's something else to look forward to. And this is important for people that uh, are tourist operators. It offers the opportunity to complement um, um, what they're already offering for these people or who are either driven to travel by an activity or for whatever various reason. Also from a standpoint, if you can convert a daytime traveler, a lot of families have been doing this for a while now that you throw the family in the car in the morning, you head out, you go a day trip and then you come back at night. With the research I've, that I've done, it's, it's the average family will spend somewhere around $120, $125 per day on gas eating and maybe accessing a uh, an attraction and all that but if you can use astronomy to give them a reason to stay overnight somewhere then an accommodation operator can benefit and then also the rest of the local economy benefits because now by converting them to stay overnight just the overnight factor now you're paying for accommodation they're paying for extra meals they might be doing more activities and more shopping uh and the Big thing right now, uh, one of the biggest segments I know here in New Brunswick, it is anyway, it appears to be one of the biggest ones in Nova Scotia is outdoor adventures. And many of the uh, tourism boards around, whether it's provincial or anywhere as I've seen in the US, uh, they are now putting stargazing uh, or astrotourism under uh, that bracket. So uh, from one thing is you're competing for attention versus the big activities like uh, here in New Brunswick, snowmobiling, for example, is a big one. Or in the region, let's say uh, Miramichi, where fishing is a big reason why people would go in the Miramichi area and all that. So you're kind of competing for that attention. And although astrotourism is niche, it's starting to pick up as well. Um, Airbnb uh, lists it as a uh, an amenity that you can search and uh, a property with if it has a telescope. So that's significant. You know, this is the biggest uh, booking platform in the world. And for them to make sure they include that as an amenity, that's turned to say that people are picking up. And uh, you know what? I'm all by myself. I don't have the resources they do from a marketing standpoint, a research standpoint. They probably have a marketing team of uh, 150, 200 people. So they know there's data there that uh, corroborates that and supports why they're, they're doing this, right? So, and it appeals to everybody of all ages, backgrounds. Uh, again, I come back to Instagram factor because it just reaches everybody and everybody finds it very neat to see something they like. Now, if you can create it to make it an experience, which we go into beyond the astronomy, you can incorporate gastronomy like food and hospitality, uh, or uh, storytelling and uh, historic significance of the night sky and all that. So I'm thinking here, uh, our First Nations, you know, they have such a rich uh, history and uh, 
folklore about their relationship with the night sky and so forth. Um, I think um, uh, Dave and another collaborator at the center did a fantastic job with that uh, that book they released uh, recently. I, I can think of maybe uh, uh, Lewisburg Fort. You know, that's a historic site or the King's Landing here in New Brunswick, you know, and maybe they can incorporate, you know, back in the day, uh, several generations ago, how did they live and how did they rely on the night sky? So there's a lot of opportunities from uh, that standpoint. And uh, I skipped one here, but uh, yeah, everybody, uh, I'd say, I think 75% of the population now in Canada is in urban centers or suburban setting. Everybody escapes it there to go on vacation. You get away from the urban jungle. So where are most dark sky sites located? Usually rural coastal communities away from light pollution. How are we doing for time, Judy? Um. Yeah, um, about another 15 minutes. Would that be? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm good. I'm just 15 to 20, just... and then we'll address questions, Stefan. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's good. I was just checking. Um, so, astrotourism, or to, as a tourism segment, uh, actually, it can actually lead a tourism strategy. Yukon's built their tourism around the Northern Lights. So, in certain occasions, it is definitely. Uh, what you can get out to the market with and selling. And uh, uh, I, I, I collaborate with a, a partner comp, uh, organization that's all about sustainable rural and coastal development. And he was on the technical visit last week uh, in Yukon and uh, he saw the Northern Lights for the first time for, uh, in his life, naked eye. He stepped out of the cabin. He was like a kid in the in the, in the candy store, it was amazing to see that reaction. But uh, I think astrotourism as a maybe a um, segment of a broader tourism strategy can work better in smaller jurisdictions. I'm thinking uh, like Southwest Nova Scotia has been doing a phenomenal job. Alma with Bundy National Park, um, because the dark sky preserve there, they're finally embarking on something there. And uh, if you look at some of the uh, uh, things happening in the uh, Western uh, provinces, uh, they've been uh, actually paying attention and actually been uh, doing a fairly good job of promoting uh, stargazing and astrotourism within their uh, provincial uh, 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 department's website and anything they do from a marketing standpoint. Uh, and, and going, uh, smaller to develop an astrotourism, whether it's a town or a region or, you know, and so forth, your, your strategy can be a lot different, which gives you the, what we call in marketing, the, uh, the brand differentiation uh, factor, which is, okay, well, if everybody throws themselves at the astrotourism, what makes you capable of standing out against all that's going to be in the market, right? So, um, uh, I'm looking at, uh, I'll pick on the Alma again, uh, you know, with the Hopewell Rocks. For astrophotographers, if you want to incorporate that foreground in a nightscape shot or a Milky Way shot, there's no worse else in the world that uh, you can have that experience with the Hopewell Rocks. You have to physically go there, just like Yukon for the Northern Lights, they, although we can see them on occasion a little bit down towards the equator, uh, Alma is where your setting is actually unique to itself. And for example, I'm thinking of uh, uh, where the lighthouse is. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, not far from Halifax, the popular uh, uh, lighthouse there. Shoot. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank. But anyways, nowhere else you, could you do that picture if unless you go there to, to take it and so forth, right? So, uh, and then uh, it creates ec economic activity and, you know, growth in rural and coastal communities. Uh, I, I, what I mean here also is uh, uh, the uh, tourism industry got hit so hard during the pandemic and, you know, the rebound has been pretty good, but the better they can improve their numbers, whether it's um, 
you know, incorporating an astro-tourism strategy in their business, even if it gave them a five, ten percent more revenue and all this and that, what would that translate? Is it a healthier business? Uh, and as a business in the community, if you're doing, if your business is healthy, does that allow you to reinvest, hire more, expand, uh, do the sponsorship of the local hockey team, and so forth? So there's a quite a benefit to, to that as well. Uh, so I'll talk more a little bit quickly about uh, Cliff Valley astronomy. Uh, you know, I'm looking at numerous uh, vertical business lines. I've uh, started with star parties, uh, like I said, and uh, now I've launched this week uh, a um, dark sky destinations network where I've brought on uh, some uh, tourism operators uh, to uh, promote them and drive traffic to them and promote them as a dark sky site. None, not all of them are in uh, around or near uh, certified dark sky sites, but they I do the research that they have to be at least something like a board of four or better to to sort of do that. So again, it's trying to create opportunities. I think uh, Atlantic Canada has so much to offer because we're we're a bit more rural, we're a bit more coastal than the rest of the country, and that creates uh, opportunities as well. So I'm acting as a connector on the number front. Uh, I'll be working also with municipal and regional tourism boards to help them develop a astro-tourism strategy. So this is where my marketing uh, skills come in. And, uh, you know, we're looking at so many much, uh, many more things uh, uh, other than that. Um, so my star parties, you know, the package I do, usually it's two hours. I go with a next star uh, six with a star sense on it because that allows me to talk while the telescope does its alignment. And then once that's done, I can deal with with the group and let the telescope by programming and then the go to feature to go to the next target so we can see as many targets as possible uh, in the two hour session. And that creates a lot of uh, value for the clients because they can typically see 15 to 20 targets in the two hour while I'm milling up to 12 people at the eyepiece. Uh, I go to them, uh, typical charge is $300 a booking. And I had 23 uh, bookings in 2022. And I did five for nonprofits and charitable causes to help them either raise money or uh, something that uh, they've requested. Um, so the Dark Sky Destination Network I just mentioned launched uh, Thursday night at 6 p.m. with the five. You have uh, uh, your guys' center uh, member, uh, Tim Doucette, with Deep Sky Eye. And then we have the four in New Brunswick, uh, Glamping with the Sea and Kokang, Storytown Cottages and Doaktown, Falcon Ridge. In an Alma near the Fundy National Park and Naturary, which is not far from here in St. John and is on the coast, and it's an impressive uh, site as well. In the first 24 hours, we got over 15,000 uh, impression likes, shares, and engagement on social media. On my website, I got a month's worth on average of traffic in one day. Uh, so that was uh, interesting to see those peaks. And uh, I've been also contacted by three potential future partners who uh, run uh, tourism operations that are interested in joining the network. So, so the early indications, it's, it's something that is grabbing people's attention and by the looks of it, there is a need uh, for, uh, to fulfill and keep working with the uh, people in the industry. Uh, there's other verticals coming. Uh, talking about a festival, some uh, rare celestial events that are coming up. I'll be doing stuff around that. And I'll do the uh, sneak announcement here. Nobody else knows that there is going to be an astronomy trade show next year here in New Brunswick. I'll have more details coming. And the last thing I really want to talk about is the uh, biggest uh, astronomical event of New Brunswick uh, probably in the last hundred years. Well, we did get one uh, approximately 50 years ago, but it only hit a small portion of the province. Uh, I've partnered up with uh, Exa Group and we are creating a conference retreat for next year's total solar eclipse. 
and uh, it'll be a uh, two and a half day retreat in Dope Town, which will be in the uh, path of uh, totality, as you can see from the map here. Uh, you know, we're in nature, the skies are great, it's uh, beautiful, it's Dope Town's a quaint town in central New Brunswick. I've uh, uh, booked completely story town cottages as well as the ledges in, and uh, we will be offering packages for people to attend. It's all inclusive. We'll have activities, your meals are included, uh, and so forth. And I'll just skip through these. Uh, these will be the package. And I've secured some interesting speakers. Notably, my keynote will be Richard Zorowski from Halifax well-known uh, meteorologist, but mostly scientists and radio um, personality. I think most people would know of him, so I'm excited to have him. Also very excited to have secured Trevor Jones, probably uh, one of the best known astrophotographers in Canada and also uh, owner of uh, astrobackyard.com, which also joins the ranks of astro entrepreneurship and his uh his lovely wife ashley will also be doing a talk on uh, light pollution she's very uh much uh for that cause and she's a big advocate so and we have also lisa ann and her husband who will be doing a fantastic presentation and excursion on birding because we will be in central new brunswick and when you're in nature that enjoyed the wildlife and everything. And uh, as you know, Lisa is very much, and Rob are very much into birding as well as astronomy. So, so I'm so excited to have all these guys, their sponsors to be announced. I already have a few, this is not up to date yet, but uh, we'll be offering payment plans too and all that. So stay tuned. I'd love to see many from uh, Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, you guys are not going to be touched by the eclipse so hopefully you know as a lifetime um, opportunity to to see it nearby um, I'd be glad to have you and be part of the group and be uh, able to take in this wonderful experience we're trying to create for everyone and that's it for me <laughs> questions thanks so much Stefan yeah, I'm trying to stop sharing my screen. I can't find the button. Uh, we'll take questions. Are there any questions from Zoom land, first of all? And then we'll go to the room. OK, there's nothing in Zoom land right now. Is there any, are there any questions from members sitting here in the room? Dave, you have a question. And we're going to have to use portable, if you would. Yeah, I'm just, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm just wondering um, how you deal with the fact that the weather is so terrible in Atlantic Canada. Because if someone <laughs> books, I mean, realistically, having done outreach at, here at St. Mary's until I retired last year, yeah. you know, we did, you know, one night a week all year. We'd luckily, luckily would be likely only to have maybe one in three evenings that were planned where it actually was clear enough to see anything. So I'm just yeah. wondering how you deal with the disappointment yeah. or the fact that, you know, you'll book. And so, so from, uh, from my private star party standpoint, uh, we knew we were going to be dealing with this, right. Uh, we've been in the hobby long enough and we, we know where we reside. So when somebody reaches out to inquire for a booking and all that, that's presented up front, say, listen, we'll book what's the date you're aiming for and you know you gotta be open and flexible that if the weather doesn't cooperate we'll have to move it either a day or two or completely reschedule are you okay with that that is the first question out of the gate and if it's they're okay with it then we move forward and what i do also to help in that um, uh, aspect is the week leading up to their event i'm giving them daily uh weather forecasts and you know, by a day or two out, we usually are able to confidently make a decision of uh, going ahead or rebooking. Now, from the astrotourism standpoint, you know, our our partners are going to have to deal with that. It's the same thing if you go to Dope Town for uh, fishing and it rains all weekend, you know. 
people are kind of, you know, or going down south and you get rain for three days, you know, it, it's just, it comes, there's, until we figure out a way to control mother nature, which I hope we don't get to that point. I think we're doing enough uh, to create uh, detriment to the nature, but uh, that's how we pretty much uh, go about it. And the funny thing about last year when I launched my private star parties, I did not have to reschedule one single star party until November. <laughs> 19 star parties without having to reschedule. Yeah, you won't find that typically as, as in my <laughs> was, but, but I, I guess I, the other question is, have you considered, um, since the ones that are associated with, you know, a venue, whether it be, a, you know, a, a inns or an inn or something like that, yeah. uh, you know, having an alternate activity that isn't like a presentation or activity or something just so that, because the, the, the reality is that just like the uh, cartoon, you know, they, they come to see the fly, high diving act and they're, they're real disappointed if they don't, right? Especially if they've paid hundreds of dollars to stay overnight. So, yeah, and and uh, so within my uh, network, I'm working with. Uh, I'm offering a service tier, a tiered service membership for uh, some of the networks. If if you just want to be listed on it, you don't have to pay a monthly fee, but I do charge a monthly fee on two different tiers that offers a little bit more help and a little bit more support in creating an astrotourism uh experience and all that so that's one of the things we're addressing in case of rain or weather not permitting and all that we're working on having these types of fallback options that they'll be able to make uh available to their guests uh each one's going to be offered a, a binder that they leave in their guests room that talks about astronomy if there's equipment available, how to self-sufficiently use them and so provide also uh, reports of uh, what's happening either uh, that month in the night sky and how to quickly find it and so forth. So, so we're dealing with that and there, there, there are options that are being worked on that they'll, uh, for some of the tiered member, they'll have available in case of rain or weather. Thank you for the answer question that arose from one of the members was what about COVID rules and I, I think that is a question that can only be answered a year out from now as to where COVID and its related uh, variants stand. Um, yeah yeah and like I said if if COVID is uh, going to be continuing to be a factor should any further lockdowns or anything that affects everything all industries everything and all so unfortunately, um, we'll have to obey by the government and uh, health uh, authorities uh, guidelines, which may mean ceasing operations for a while or uh, accommodating certain uh, requirements, either wearing masks or instead of being people to the uh, IPs, uh, maybe uh, putting a, ca a planetary camera or any camera and just um, presenting it on the screen with a projector or an actual TV screen or something where you can w safely watch it without being on top of each other or touching stuff uh, by numerous people. And uh, I believe Mary Lou Whitehorn has a... Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Um, well, Dave Lane asked my first question. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the sometimes inevitable disappointment because not, not the weather mm -hmm. but people are used to seeing these fabulous images mm -hmm. from hubble and webb and yep. the very skilled um, astrophotographers among mm -hmm. us and then they step up to a telescope and that planet is really tiny if it's mars it's really hard to see yep. any details yep. or that nebula is really faint um and they say um I thought I was going to see big, bright, and colorful, but this is really dull and drab. <laughs> yeah. So I preface that because uh, while the telescope does its own alignment, because I turn it on and it's doing whatever for a few minutes, I, I, I preface that. I specifically say, I know you've seen all these wonderful images on the internet or in the book uh, from James Webb or a professional, almost professional uh, astrophotographer. 
you'll you'll see that it's not quite that type of detail or that type of brightness and all that. So uh, keep in mind that whatever you'll be looking at, the light photons from that object has been traveling hundreds, thousands, millions of years to reach your eyeball. And then that's, you'd be surprised at the fact that they can see something through the eyepiece, how much of still a reaction you get, regardless of what they've seen on Instagram or in the science book or whatever. Uh, there's something very visceral to see it with your own eyes. It creates that type of reaction. A lot of times it's, it's amazement, sometimes it's emotional, uh, but, um, you know, I do preface that before we start. So sort of set the expectations and I, I'm very judicial when they, when I get a booking and they give me a date, I go on Stellarium and build a target list. And I really pick this, the ones that are, you know, I know they'll, they'll have a, it'll be a hit with most of the people in the group. Like the owl cluster is one that people just find it pretty neat and all that. Uh, you know, with my C6, I, I, Jupiter, Saturn, they're easy to see. We can see very well. Um, if it's a night with the moon, that's always a big one. Uh, in the summer months, like half the time is spent between Sagittarius and Scorpius. And, um, you know, because there's just so much. And even with either using a, a filter and all that and have a couple of the brighter nebulas, those really make people have a very very positive uh, experience once you can see an actual nebula with your own eyes. So, so it's all, it's information is key. That's it. It's setting the expectations too, right? Because a lot of the people that book a star a private star party with me are not seasoned astronomers, right? So, so their gap of understanding why can I see it uh, like I see it on the internet to, you know, how the science of optics, the light and all that works. So you got to sort of nudge them a little bit without being too uh, uh, technical where you'll get deers in the headlight looks because, you know, so that's one of the things I try to be mindful not to be overwhelming on the science aspect and just use more like snippets to create a, a, a fun did you know type of thing. Science sound bites, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like uh, when I tell uh, young kids, you know, the nearest star to us is four light years away, roughly. Four doesn't sound much, right? But then I explained to them, it's 40 trillion kilometers. If we turn those kilometers into seconds and we went back in time, we would be with woolly mammoths. And then they go, oh, you know? So, you know, it's creating a narrative that helps them understand and get the perspective of what it really means when I say four light years. <laughs> That's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty fun to find those ways of, you know, and a lot of time I tell them, let's play a game, try to stump the astronomer. And oh boy, the question has come. And between you and I, those two hours fly by. <laughs> they do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the, the adults are even better than the kids sometimes. The reactions, the questions, I, uh, it, it, you'd be surprised. Okay. Thanks so much, Stefan. Um, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today and providing some insight as to the whole astrotourism astro industry. Uh, certainly, there was a lot more room for uh, improvement, uh, expansion uh, in both our provinces. So and yes. I'm sure across the country as well, because I think you're quite right. Um, we tend to, the tourism industry tends to focus on what can I do during the day versus I'm bored at night. What can I do? Yeah. There's so yeah. much to see up there. Yeah, so thank exactly. you very much. Yeah. No, I really appreciate it again. Thank you very much. I, unfortunately, I cannot stay for your whole uh, meeting. I got a St. John Astronomy Club tonight at seven and this past week with the launch, I've worked 70 to 80 hours and uh, if I don't go to supper with the in-laws, uh, I'll be crucified. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will let you go. So thank you so much. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, now that brings us to our break. It is what time is it? Two o seven. We'll say two ten.
So 2.25, uh, everyone come back. The people that are in the room certainly um, have a chance to go down the hall if you need to, come down here and, and chat with us. And those of you in Zoom land, we will turn off the recording and you can, and you can chat amongst yourselves um, and, and just like we used to do in the Astro Chats uh, when we were only on Zoom. Okay, so seven. Or so welcome back, everyone. It is now 2.25, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who happens to be from our own center, Halifax Center. Chris Young is a longtime member of RASC, and those of you who have been around for a while certainly may have seen Chris in many roles in the center. One of them, um, more importantly, at least from my life as Nova East chair over a few years, was his prized role um, as a member on that committee. And if you, those of you that knew his role in acquiring prizes, you'll know why I say he was prized. Chris is going to be presenting a really interesting topic today. He had sent me the article that he was basing his presentation on, and I figured, oh, wow. For those of us who have been or are familiar with ancient civilizations and how they view the world and how they take the natural world to, uh, and how it controls theirs, um, you'll appreciate what Chris is about to tell us. So without further ado, I'll leave it up to you, Chris, to explain the mysteries of the Andean farmers. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, we're good? We're good. Good to go. All right, and we'll try. Oh, that's great. Terrific. Um, so, so, well, it's nothing like having technology. Um, so, so today we're, uh, we're going to South America. Uh, in a couple of presentations ago, we were up on the Caribbean coast. Um, this time, we're down on the west coast, um, and sort of looking at Peru and Bolivia. Um, down in the uh, bottom center, is where the Atacama Desert is, which is where ALMA is and the Very Large Telescope. Um, the white spot in the middle, which looks like snow to us, is, is, a, is a salt lake. And a uh, dark spot a little farther up uh, is Lake Titicaca. And the area that we're interested in is kind of along the edge of the green, um, mostly above Lake Titicaca, uh, so which is in part of Peru, Ecuador is center a little bit center right all the green is that's on the that's the amazon side of the andes uh, here's a view from the one of the space shuttles when they were doing a repair mission on hubble so hubble is top left um, underneath that which is mostly white which is cloud is over the amazon and then the edge of that is is the andes which is holding back the cloud and then the brown is the uh, Altiplano, which is a, a large plateau, uh, which leads up to the mountains. Um, to bottom right is, is cloud cover over the Pacific. And then along the shoreline uh, well, is the Pacific. And uh, there's usually a current that comes up from the South Ocean, the Humboldt Current, which brings nutrients and stuff, which feeds the, feeds the fish, which feeds the birds, which makes the guano, which gives us the fertilizer. Um, the here's a, a, a picture of the Altiplano. Uh, so it's a, we've got it's a pretty dry, um, arid plain. Um, but as you get up to the up to the mountains, uh, it's um, it's moister up there. It's also a little cooler, which is good uh, because we're. Oh, I should say yes. What what what's the astronomy connection? Well, it's the Pleiades, and the connection is that the. Uh, the farmers, Andean farmers, Peru, um, Ecuador, uh, in late June, climb up hills and mountains, and they wait for the for the Pleiades to rise just before uh, the sun comes up. And depending upon the kind of quality of the observation, does it come up big and bright, or is it kind of a bit murky, not too many stars? That determines when they're going to plant um, plant their potatoes, um, because the they take this as an indicator of what the rainfall is going to be like through their growing season. Now, the uh, and the interesting thing is is that they go up on the twenty the night of the so it'd be the twenty third and the twenty fourth of June. They don't plant until September, so we got months to go by before they plant. But they, that's when they make their plan. 
Um, the other thing to note is, I don't know if you appreciate that the Pleiades is upside down to us because we're in the in the southern uh, hemisphere, and so uh, sort of sort of over on the right hand side, we've got Orion, which is upside down. In the center, you can see Aldebaran is the bright um, yellow dot as part of Taurus, and the Pleiades is off to the left. So. There is a vegetable associated with this presentation, and that's the potato. Okay. Uh, last presentation was corn, so we're in potato season. There's a, about 4,000 varieties of potatoes in the world. 3,000 of them are grown in, in, in Peru and Bolivia. Um, they were developed about 8,000 years ago. They've been a principal food all, all the time along. Um, they, can, they actually had worked out a way to freeze dry potatoes. That's which is a, a pretty interesting thing, which is a involves putting them out in the cold and then leaving them out in the sun and then you know then stepping on them a bunch, sometimes soaking them in water and a bunch of things. But they could but they would keep for a couple of years, which is not a which is a pretty interesting thing. The uh, top left is is say uh, some storehouses or or qualca. Um, the Incas had storage uh, facilities all the way through the kind of the Inca air, uh, empire. They were very organized. They could move people around quite a lot. Um, they had what they needed. And then uh, to your right is the coastline. Well, actually, the, uh, it's the whole Inca Empire, which started in around 1300 or so and lasted until ooh, da, 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 the, when the Spaniards arrived. I think it's around 1532. And that's when things went very bad for, for the Aztecs. Uh, there's two red lines on the on that map of South America. Um, one of them is a solid, which is, uh, they're both roads, one's dotted, one's solid. One of them um, is along the edge of the mountains and the other is, uh, is along the edge of the coast. Um, they, were, they were great engineers at, at building roads, building terraces, building buildings. Their stonework is second to none in the world. Um, oh, no. And about the time when the Spaniards arrived, there were 12 million people in the Aztec Empire. 150 years later, 80% of them were gone, right? And the same issue with Europeans arriving was we brought all the diseases, right? I mean, so the, uh, so as I mentioned to you, um, in June, which is on the right hand, the bottom, kind of bottom right here, this is when they climb up the mountains or the hillsides and they go and they wait for the, the Pleiades to rise. And the planting doesn't happen um, up until around sep into September, October. Um, and the rains begin um, usually the end of October and on for several months. And depending upon the quality of the observations of the Pleiades, if they're nice and bright, then they plant on the regular basis and they feel they're pretty confident about having a good crop. If the, the Pleiades are not very visible, they can't see very many, they're kind of dim, then they hold back for another month to six weeks because they're not going to, they don't believe they'll get the rain and therefore the potatoes will suffer because it, having moisture is, is uh, uh, critical to potato growth. So this is, this is a picture from um, uh, sort of one of the main articles I'd make reference to. And the photo is taken by a guy named Benjamin Orlov. And uh, this is, so this is, gives you an idea. It's not your regular PEI potato field. It's, it's on the high sides of hills and mountains. Um, and the soil's not very good there. So they, they'll grow crops for a year or two. And then they then they let it go fallow and they just and they let the llamas and alpacas and goats and things um, eat on it. And then after they've given all the vegetation a chance to really root back into the earth, then they have to go back and and uh, and dig it up again. And it's these are subsistence farmers. Now these this was his the original articles were written um, in uh, the article was written around 2000. The Orlov is. Is an anthropologist, and he was there in the 70s doing research on farming communities. And as a lark, he went up with one whole group of farmers as they climbed up the hills in the mountain in the middle of the night, in the middle of winter, the 24th of June, the, the 23rd, I guess, of June, right, to wait with the Pleiades. And 
from what I understand, when they go up and they have these events, there's singing, there's dancing, there's some drinking, there's some cocoa leaves. It seems like it's a real road trip right, that they go up. And so it sounds, it sounds like it's, you know, like most social events, you know, they make the best of it. Um, anyways, so he, you know, he was sort of aware of what they were looking at the Pleiades, but didn't, didn't pay too much attention to that. Um, he wrote up his kind of his sort of a bit a little bit of an adventure um, a few years later and put it in a paper. I have searched the internet and the libraries in Southern California, and I cannot find that paper. He's written about 200 papers. He's written books. Um, anyway, uh, and he's and I have found recountings of other trips, road trips, if you will, up the mountains on different festival days, and. And it's it's generally a party. So so anyway, so I imagine it is. So you can see they have what a device here is known as a foot plow, which is a long long piece of wood. It's got something hard on the end of it. They stick into the soil, and it's got a little lever there towards the the bottom end. And that that was in use when the Spaniards arrived in in the 1500s. It's been around for a very long time. So Orlov, uh, anyway, so he he did his stuff. He put it in his paper. Anyway, there was another fellow came along named Kane who uh, had some background in the sciences. He was on tour, doing a, a vacation in, in Peru, and his guide told him about the fact the farmers, you know, look judge, look at the stars, and that's how they judge when they're going to plant. And he thought, well, that's curious. So wonder, wonder why, how is, how does that work, right? And this is, this is going to determine when you plant months ahead. So anyway, he's curious about that. He goes back to California the University and he asks around, no, nope, nobody doesn't knows anything. This is in the early 90s, the mid 90s. And anyway, somebody says, oh, you should talk to Orlov, who's also um, in the, down in California. As it turned out, they both went to the same schools in New York City, like those odd coincidences. And they talked about it and they said, you know what, we should, we should do, a, to do some research here. There's probably a paper here. So they got together and they invited another, another a third person in in terms to help deal with the studies on climate. And they organized the information um, and they used, they were looking at information that they had on, they had 12 villages in Peru and, and Bolivia. Um, they looked at obviously the rainfall, the dates, they looked at satellite data, they looked at, um, at sort of what the potato yields were, how many pounds of potatoes they got, in certain years, um, and uh, and they had a good hunch that somehow what the farmers was doing was related to El Nino, because El Nino is was which we hear now about our weather, right? Um, you know, they thought it's uh, you know likely had something to do with that. So the the correlation was there in terms of of when El Nino's events occurred, there were there were droughts, the potato yields were down, so so that's fine. So they got that. So the way El Nino works is uh, typically over in the top left, the sort of trade winds come across from the east, they go across South America, and they push the warm water and stuff over to the west side of the Pacific. And the water piles up there, 18 inches to 24 inches higher on the west side of the Pacific than it is on the east side of the Pacific. And along the, the coast of the South America, there the cold water is comes up is, runs along the surface, and that feeds the fish, um, which in turn feeds the, as I said feeds birds and things. So that's that's how things go in a in a normal year. But every average three to four years, they'll get an El Nino event, and in the El Nino event, the warm water stays uh, close to the Pacific coast, or I should say, yeah, Pacific coast of South America. And the cold water is, is stays is stays depressed, and so they get um, they get some issues of fish kills. Birds don't do very well. Uh, fishing is poor and things. So that's kind of how it goes. And then down here at the bottom, you'll see there's kind of a graph of of, of occurrences of El Nino events, and it happens every two to seven years with an average of three to four. Uh, and what else we got here? So. This is um, uh, kind of a plan view. So in the, in the center is the normal situation. And you can tell you the, 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 the sort of rich blue on the right-hand side uh, 
close to South America, is the, is the colder water, so that's kind of normal. This is in December, the warmer water is pushed mostly to the Western Pacific. El Nino on the bottom, we can see that the, you have the, the warmer water is close to uh, the West Coast of South America and, and Central America. And that's what's in, in, and this is interfering with the normal um, coastal part of the events. Now, El Nino is a short form of El Nino de la Tividad, which means essentially it's really talking about, if you will, the Christ child, the small boy sort of at Christmas, the, the nativity. And originally it meant um, it was coined by Spanish fishermen who mentioned this, they, they called this from, from when they used to get warm water currents that would come just along the coast of South America. And this was a, this was a normal event, not an El, an El Nino event as, as we now understand it, but that business of talk, relating to having warm water and it's, it happens around Christmas, which is why they called it El Nino de la Tividad. Um, so anyway, and then that's kind of transferred itself to being talking about what they call the, the Southern Oscillations, which is the, the, uh, this, this business of, of hot air and, hot, and water moving back and forth across the Pacific. The very top bar is the La Nina event, which is when we got the, the cold water stays there and we sort of all the hot is pushed far to the, uh, to the West, to Australia and, and the Asia. And so that, and that often affects our, our, weather, um, our weather here. Anyway, but I was intrigued to find that, you know, El Nino was originally, as I said, just a, a local current along the coast that the, and the you know, Spanish fishermen had named that. But it's now kind of wormed its way to describing a whole situation. So what we have on a normal year, the, 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 the winds come across, they go across from east to west, across South America, and they bring moisture from sort of the equatorial side over the Andes. And that helps uh, helps the potatoes. On an, an El Nino year, we've got warm weather and warm air and, and high uh, would be I guess atmospheric highs on the along the west coast over the Pacific, and that holds those winds back from coming up over the Andes. Now, so we have correlation between the weather, El Nino events, moisture, potato harvests, but what is it? about what it is it that affects the visibility of the Pleiades. So one of the things they checked was with, with satellite data and using, they, it took at least data from at least two satellites to determine that there's a, a, a thin band of high cirrus clouds, which are not visible. You look up, you don't see them. They're up in the, the uh, 10,000 meters um, kind of elevation and they interfere with visibility, but, um, but, they're, but they're quite high up. Um, this was a, a, a table that's included in the paper, and they list the 12 villages. They talk about what elevations, and you notice the elevation, the lowest elevation there is 3,300 meters. So we're, 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 we're over 10,000 feet. Cusco, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire, was around 12,000 feet, right? So they're, they're pretty high up there. And they, on the 24th of June, climb hills and mountains in order to look for them. So they go up higher again. So they looked at the, the data that they had. Um, some of the villages would, would look, uh, go up before the 24th of June. Some went only at the 24th of June. And then they also talked about the date of first appearance, you know, how big was with Pleiades. Um, they talked about the position of the stars. And then did they modify their planting dates based on what they saw? And essentially it was pretty much a yes, everywhere. So um, this is from Sky Safari. The uh, yellow stripe coming up the middle is, is the ecliptic. Uh, we're on, um, I picked the date of 1490, which is just prior to Columbus, so, so it's pre-Columbian. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side is Taurus, upside down. Uh, Aldebaran, I think it's just below the, below the horizon. And then we have the Pleiades uh, up on the on the left hand side. The at this point, uh, this is about nine degrees above um, above the horizon, and sort of sunrise and the brightening of the sky 
would make this, they wouldn't be able to see it in an hour, an hour and a half after this. So um, in the paper, they suggested they did a mock-up. On the left-hand side, they say, okay, well, they're gonna see between six and 11 stars. And so they just, uh, they just kind of, kind of dim them out a little bit. So at the bottom, we've got six, there's seven in the middle and 11 at the top. And they discuss in the paper a little bit about those factors that would influence looking, you know, the, the quality of, 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 of seeing the Pleiades. And so one of the things was, was, was because the elevation, you go up higher, you tend to see more. And you see more because there's less air, and less pollutants in the air and things. They talked about extinction, which is what happens when you look towards the horizon and you're low because there's there's 1,100 kilometers of air between you and the horizon, like where you're starting to see into space, versus 100 kilometers of air directly over your head. So, you know, that's extinction. Aerosols, which are particulate, that's in the air. And that could be, that actually includes moisture, but it could include dust from volcanoes. It could include sand from the Sahara, which blows across the, the, uh, the, you know, across the Atlantic. Um, a whole variety of uh, pollutants and things. I wouldn't doubt that there's been smoke particles from the, you know, the last 10 or 20 years of burning down the Amazon. Um, moisture, it's included in aerosols, but we're, we're kind of talking about clouds and we have a lot of experience here with moisture. Um, the turbulence in the air, they talked to some amateur astronomers who said, well, turbulence in the air, the speed of the air at high levels, these things affects apoxia. So when you get higher, there's less oxygen in the air. And one of the, this has been a consideration by, um, and you'll 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 see it written up in the journals. Um, Stephen James O'Meara uh, says that you know up to nine thousand feet it's no problem, but above nine thousand feet, the lack of, of the d diminishing amount of oxygen will 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 hurt your observations because you don't have enough oxygen in your in your retina. So which is interesting. I don't know, Mary, Mary Lou may still be online. She and I um, conversed a little bit and she's been up on Mauna Kea, Mauna Kea um, and they did experiments with and without oxygen. And one of the things is, is if you get older, your eyes get used to working with less oxygen. So it's less of an issue. Um, and she could see, I think down to 6.7 magnitude, I think at, up at, at that elevation. Now, um, another question was raised in the paper of, which I think it was, I think it came from Orloff, which was, you know, God knows, how, how do they even know what a year, you know, when they go next year, how, how are they going to remember the star party? And anyway, I'll comment on that a little bit. So the date that the farmers were interested in was, you know, did it show up early on time? Was it late? The overall brightness, the overall size, um, the number of stars, um, the shape and the location, the, 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 Asterism changes shape a bit. The fewer stars you can see, it alters the shape. So, so to, to, to their eyes. And then there, um, they'd also observed that under when things were really good, they can see between certain stars. Whereas when the seeing wasn't quite as good, some of the stars seem to blend together, which is which is quite true. So, can you give me the next one, please? There we go, thank you. So, so this is another rehash of that same list. You know, in terms of elevation, they're at a minimum of 12,000 feet. Mauna Kea, the top of it is 13,800, and we've all seen pictures of Mauna Kea, and it looks like the seeing is pretty good. So I, I, I don't think, and I don't think there's an issue. I think they have lots of things to say. And where I'm leading up to is that the paper talks between six and 11 stars. And I'm thinking they can see a lot more than that when it's when it's good. Extinction, I don't think applies. They're on the west side of the Andes. They climb up a hill or a mountain. They look out horizontally over a top of the, on another hill or mountain. So they're looking horizontally. They're not looking down towards the, the Atlantic Ocean on the coast of, of Brazil. Right? So they're still looking, looking up high. Um, the aerosols, they're probably low density. Um, they they did report they investigated whether you know sand from the Sahara would would uh, would affect things and there weren't any. Um, 
they had did some investigation and calculation um, in terms of the how much visibility would they lose through this high non-visible cirrus cloud, which is up around 10,000 meters. And it looked like it would drop um, your visibility from 0.1 to one full magnitude, which I don't know if that's how important that is. Stephen James Amera, who sets a very high bar in terms of being able to observe things, commented that he gains um, half to one magnitude of visibility for every 3,000 feet he is above sea level, right? So um, I, I'm, I'm thinking the dim diminishment by the, by, the, by, the, by the high cirrus clouds, I think is, is probably real. I should interject here, I've not been to Peru and I don't know, right? It's so, like in terms of having seen or how many stars there are, but I'm thinking they could see more stars. Um, turbulence is there, twinkling, you know, ability to focus on it. Hypoxia doesn't, it doesn't apply. These are highland Peruvians, okay? They have something like three times the hemoglobin we have, two, an extra two liters of blood in their systems. They've got an additional um, to like 25% more lung volume. I mean, we send Olympic athletes to, go, to train at high altitudes in order, in order to make them more efficient, right? So they've, they've been doing this, they've been up there for, you know, been around there for thousands of years. Um, the nebulosity could interfere if you're up and and because the Pleiades is traveling through an area of gas and dust, and that's what kind of gives it those kind of interesting glow ar around them. So the per per Peruvians and actually would be some Bolivians as well. They're interested in the in the first date. That kind of uh, sort of makes sense, though it shouldn't differ very much. They're interested um, in the brightness. So the we say that the, the, the Pleiades overall has a brightness, combined brightness about 1.6 magnitude. Um, individually, they go from around 8.8 .8 to uh, 2.7, I think. So it depends whose list you're checking. Um, the overall size is up to two degrees. Uh, that's four times the diameter of a full moon, right? It's so that they, they're, they're quite substantial. The number of visible stars is likely five to 20, right? Um, and the shape and location of the main stars. So as, the, as you blot out a lot of the, of the, of the smaller, smaller or less bright stars, then the pattern's gonna change a little bit. Um, and the separation and blending of stars, which was an, an observation that these farmers made, well, that depends upon the scene. The stars are sufficiently split that with good eyes, which I don't have, um, they, would be, they would be able to distinguish individual stars. As, as it gets a little murkier, then things tend to blend together. Uh, as I mentioned down at the bottom, Stephen James Amira has counted, he's counted 17 stars in the Pleiades from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that would have been around 1980 or so, I think. And he mentions Walter Scott um, Houston has counted 18, that's kind of the record. He was uh, an observer who wrote a lot of columns in the, uh, I think it was in Sky and Tell, I believe, and it's quite a noted, quite a noted observer. Um, so I'm I'm thinking that there's a lot more stars for the for the farmers to see. Um, here's kind of a list. There's I think 11 or to 13 stars here, and um, the the dimmest is on there. It looks like 6.47. Um, so there's so there's there's lots of stars to see. Um, on your left is uh, a chart that's on. See this on the web, uh, on uh, on a, a site by Mel Bartels. Mel Bartels is a a noted amateur telescope maker and an observer. And anyway, he he brings this in from some other software, showing there's the Pleiades pattern as we would see it in the north. Um, and the, the brightness of, of the stars that are there. And then to your right uh, is a shot of the Pleiades, which didn't have a lot of the uh, nebulosity showing, and it looked a little bit more like it would probably look to the naked eye, though we're seeing stars that are um, certainly uh, less than six or 6.5 or seven or so. Uh, Stephen James American see down to 8.4 when he's up at altitude. So a um, 
couple a couple of questions. So one of the things is they go up on the 24th of June and the 21st, 22nd of June is the solstice. So why is it the 24th? And I suspect it is because that's kind of got, got kicked from being a solstice observation to being um, a religious um, festival, which it is the, it's the uh, festival of, of, San, of San Juan. So, so it's, it's, the, it's the birth date of St. John the Baptist, okay, which was a big, a big religious holiday, if you will, um, in the Christian world from almost from the beginning. It's, it's, it's recorded back to around the year 500 or so. When the Spaniards came, they destroyed all of the religious icons, buildings, symbols, right? They, 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 they kind of stamped it out, right? They destroyed all the records. Um, you know, they carted off the gold, melted it and stuff, um, but they, they, they changed everything. And they have a history of, um, uh, in the Christian world, particularly the Catholic Church, of, you know, of building a church on whatever, you know, if there was a temple, you build a church on top of it, right? So they erase things from people's memory. They, they rebrand them. So I think, I think I suspect that the solstice uh, observations, uh, because the Aztecs were great astronomers, they were very interested, the sun, the moon, um, Venus, and um, the Pleiades in particular. And they knew when the solstice was. So in the Aztec world, the, the mountains, the water, the air, these are all, these are all essentially spirits or gods. And they would, they would give um, sort, of, sort of sacrifices and things towards them. So they were, these mountains are, you know, they have an enormous presence. And obviously over the top of them, this is where the weather came from, right? Because it generally comes from, from the east to the west. Um, and there were things, um, rivers, springs, uh, caves in the earth. These were all Holy Spirits. So this, their world was around them, was, was, was full of the spirits. Um, just a little north of where this picture is taken, there's an event every year, which is at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, and it attracts tens of thousands of native Peruvians um, who go up uh, to the mountain um, to, to uh, you know, participate in, in festivities. So, right, thousands of them. The, um, so on this date, it was interesting enough, the, they created, there was a miracle in, in Peru. And so this became kind of a holy spot for this miracle. And it had to do with somebody turning, um, anyway, that's a story. You, could, you can look it up on, on, on Wikipedia, but there's a church up over to the top left, which shows you that um, you know, they, they left their mark everywhere. But nonetheless, thousands of people come and it's whenever they go, they, they trek up onto, the, onto the, uh, the glaciers, they bring crucifixes and stuff with them, big crosses and stuff. Like it, they, everything got sort of melded together. Um, and, but it also probably kept them from being persecuted. So these these are these have been have been rebuilt. I did find an older photo, which showed them about a quarter to a third of that height, and one of them had a big wooden cross on the top of it. So there was a a, a decree from Lima from the church that all of the sites were to be leveled. They were all to be destroyed. If the, if, the, if the ground was pretty good, they could be, to build a church on it. If it wasn't, then they, was put a, they were to put a, 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 a cross on it, right? So they were actively. So these, this is up quite a ways and it's not that easy to get to. So they think that somebody got a little lazy and didn't fully destroy them. They've since been rebuilt. So these were part of a number of stone pillars that were constructed all the way around Cusco, capital of, uh, of the Aztec world. And they would sight um, the sun. These are these are our markers, astronomical markers, and they would look at where the sun rose and set relative to these. And they had them all the, all the way around Cusco. And in terms of what that might look like, so I went looking for, you know, what does the sun look like when it's coming through stone, and, and that keeps leading you back to um, Stonehenge and all those things. But 
This is another site um, 1400 years before the Aztecs uh, in Peru um, called Chinquilo. And there's 13 towers here that are built up out of stone along this ridge. Um, it's about, a th they're about 300 meters, a thousand feet long. That ridge just runs north south. There's a point on either side of it that when you, you stand there and you, and you sight. So this is the, this is the, the June solstice. Six months later, the sun is up over on the far right hand side. So now there's a little, there's some argument among the academics because when you have these, um, these amazing claims, then you're supposed to have amazing proofs. And needless to say, there's not a lot of records from, from 200 BC in, in, in Peru. But I, I find it fairly convincing, and at least it's a good example of what, what, you, what you might have seen if you were a, an Aztec and sighting the sun. Sort of. um, these are three papers covering the same topic, um, which I, I made reference to. Um, they're all available on the internet. I, they, they make good reading. I would take, if I were going to look, read one, I would read the, the middle one, Ethnoclimatology in the Andes, as being uh, a little more readable. The science one was, was a letter to Nature magazine. And uh, the universities and NASA also produced several um, kind of uh, papers on, you know, t talking about these things. Because if, if you were working with NASA and dealing with satellites, then they took the satellite side and how important the satellites were in determining all of this. And I got into this business of the, the visibility of the Pleiades became, um, I got a bit obsessed with that. Um, the Bartel, Mel Bartel's papers there on, on the top left, um, bbastrodesigns.com, and he discusses how many, uh, how many Pleiades, how many stars you should be able to see. Um, Sky and Telescope had an article, and they talked about how you'd go about, you know, sort of counting them, how you'd organize your viewing. And Stephen James O'Mara had one in Astronomy Magazine, and essentially the, essentially the same thing, and then he repeated the uh, the remarks that Walter Scott Houston, Houston has holds the record at 18 stars visible. I mean, my brother-in-law in the desert down the southwest has seen, I think, I think he's seen 12, maybe 14. I think he, he had good eyes, and he's at high elevation, very dry, exceptional situation. Anyway, so um, that's that's it. So these farmers, oh. Just to let you know, in terms of, of how often the, the farmers were correct when they look at and they go back over history. So in terms of long-term predictions of rainfall, right, along the Andes, okay, the scientific approach gives you 50 to 60% accuracy. If you cite the Pleiades, they have 65% accuracy. So, and this is just because there's a natural phenomena I believe that the Aztecs had, they made a lot of observations. They kept track of these things. And I suspect that through the year and years that they, they, they noticed that there was an association with this. This would have been very important to them because this was, this is where their food came from. Anyway, um, thank you. I don't know if you, if you have any, any questions or not. Uh, oh, yes, Dave. Yeah, just a, a comment. Couple comments. I guess one is related to the, the high cirrus cloud. Yep. Since you're trying to see this object very, very low on the horizon, right? Yeah. These thin invisible clouds turn into a cross section, is what makes them be an issue, right? Because you yeah, you're like you're seeing them at a lower angle, therefore you'd be looking through a little looking bit through a more effectively more a thicker a column, a of, thicker. Yeah, yeah, I mean we notice it. You know, the day before a storm comes in, you know, you have that cirrus leading the storm in the west, and, and we think, oh yeah, it's going to be a crappy night for observing tonight because, you know, we see that cloud in the distance. But when you actually get underneath it, it's really actually quite thin. So you can often see it, see not too bad under that thin cirrus, but it's not too thick. But a lot, and I, I often refer to it as the ring nebula effect. Yeah. Well, since it would be early. If you will, um, early in terms of the visibility, the Pleiades would have risen, risen up that high, but I suspect it's probably nine degrees because it's got to get above the mountains in, that are mm. in front of you, yeah. right, to get up higher visibility. I didn't get around to calculating the amount of air there was if you went horizontally from, say, 12,000 feet um, out. I didn't get around to calculating that, but I suspect 
uh, if you if you if you look at the right to the horizon, that's eleven hundred kilometers of air. Whereas to the yeah. to the Carmen yeah. line, and whereas astronomers would call that air mass. Air mass, that's right. Yeah. And if you directly overhead, there's a hundred kilometers up to the Carmen line, which is that kind of a it's one of the boundary lines between, if you will, the atmosphere and space. It won't support. Uh, you can't fly an aircraft up there. There's just not enough molecules to kind of lean on. Um, meteors burn up below that line. So it's interesting that you mentioned that discussion with Mary Lou about the observing in the um, Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea, and uh, I was one of the participants of that experiment. Of that experiment. Well, there we go. <clears throat> Good. And uh, I think the the summary. You know, I'd like to say a lot of people used to say that. That when they got out, when they looked at at fourteen thousand feet, they didn't see as well as they did from nine thousand or six thousand or sea level. And our conclusion after uh, after doing that experiment was that they did they were not acclimatized. Yeah. So we found we didn't do the experiment until we'd already spent a few nights at living at nine thousand and observing at fourteen thousand before we did the experiment. So we felt we were not only we were dark adapted, but we also were somewhat acclimatized to the yeah. conditions. And I don't, if I remember correctly, without having reread the art, reread the article we published, I don't think we found a whole lot of difference between. between yeah, that was the, that's the, essentially in the and I you know yeah. uh, maybe Mary Lou may show up here momentarily uh, and to talk about that. But but the the Andeans, they have they got loads of hemoglobin, right? They got good blood flow. They got great lungs. Um, they've been well adapted. So there's no, no shorter, no, they're, they can see well. If, they've got, if their eyes are in working condition and are not ruined by screens, um, you know, then, then, then I don't doubt that they would seeing a lot more than, than, than 11 stars on a really good night. I really don't, I think it's gotta be a lot higher than that. As I said, I've not been there um, and I've been, been thinking about contacting a, another astronomer who tell who talks about made of star lore and stuff who's who's been he's an astrophysicist and has been on at the uh, atacama um, at alma and i was i was i was thinking about calling him up and asking how many stars can you see right so and i so i may get get to that yet um anyway um thank you for um for your your attention anyway you can't escape yet. I can't I, I, escape. No, uh -oh. I believe Mary Lou has a comment to, to make or a question to ask you. Okay. I guess I'm live. I got unmuted. Oh, yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> uh, Chris, that was fascinating. Thank you. Um, as Dave mentioned, we did this uh, little study on Mauna Kea, and we did minimum visual magnitudes with and without, with and without oxygen, supplementary oxygen, um at a few different elevations uh, i think 6700 9300 and <clears throat> 14000 feet um and and what we found is that our vision was slightly better um up high but we were dark adapted and we were probably as acclimatized to the elevation as we could be in the five nights we had been up at that elevation um Long-term sort of uh, uh, racial acclimatization is really interested. And um, the other place in the world that people are doing studies, of course, there are the Himalaya and Sherpa people. And um, they're still not finding a whole lot of physiological differences other than there's got to be some genetic component that enables them to, um, to survive the way they do. Um, with not as much acclimatization or adaptation as you might think. But the, the thing with vision is really interesting because um, gram for gram, gram for gram, the brain uses 10 times the amount of oxygen as the rest of the human body. And gram for gram, the human retina uses 10 times the amount of oxygen as the brain. And that explains a great deal of the visual acuity at high elevation where there's low oxygen. Uh, and uh, the brain and the retina are very efficient at stripping the oxygen that they need out of the bloodstream. So you can feel crappy, <laughs> but your eyes are still gonna work until things totally collapse. 
Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's an interesting thing, um, this elevation and adaptation, but um, the different types of tissue in the body are gonna get what they need until they can't get any more. Um, so that's all I had to say, but it's a fascinating story you've told us today. Well, thank you, Mary. Very Lee. sophisticated. I, I believe there are there are three groups in going through the literature um, who are at high altitude, and they all seem to have slightly different ways of accommodating the 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 uh, the lower oxygen levels. Because there's one on the Tibetan tap tap tableau. Uh, excuse me. Plateau. Thank you. It's coming to you now. I mean, I think there's also some in another, another group in Africa, but they have there's slightly different ways that their bodies have 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 accommodated it. But the um, the Peruvians have been have been or Andean people have been uh, have been pretty well studied. Um, and anyway, so uh, Wikipedia and the internet is you know fabulous place to read a lot of really interesting things. Um, I spend a not a lot of hours <laughs> being distracted um, by everything from you know, the highest human sacrifice is at 18,000 feet in the Andes. Um, they used to sacrifice children and little llamas and stuff like to the, to the gods. This was a regular thing and, and understood by the population. Um, anyway, this is, it's just remarkable. There were about five civilizations, I think, along the West Coast um, of South America. Like the, and the, the Aztec was the last, but there, there, there were ones preceding which seemed to have had similar practices. I think this is a long evolution of um, looking at the stars, seeing the fact that the, the mountains were gods, but they were, they were present and you had to deal with them and had to make them happy. The, the kings of the, of the Aztecs, would, they would go out on the, on, and they had a big plaza in central Cusco, and they would go out and they would, they would be there for the solstices because they have these markers, these stone pillars set up, and they would be there and they, were, they associated themselves with the sun and that's where they got their power. And so they would be there and they would whoop, and yes, the sun comes up exactly where it's supposed to. Well, they would have people studying that all the time. And there were sacrifices made and things. And then there's so, so they were, you know, they knew how to, all of those people who were in looking for power and control, be it, you know, the, the, the high end people in the, in the Aztec world or, or in the Christian world, you know, kn knows how to manipulate things, how to control the information and control the power. I mean, it's, um, been an interesting study, you know, at the same time that we've had these parallels with in terms of the indigenous situation in Canada. Um, so anyway, I, I continue to be somewhat shocked and appalled as I, as I go through this. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, actually, if I have I have oh. one other yeah. quick one, if I may. Yeah, I just want to thank you again for that oh. presentation. Um, there was a group of four of us as you know, that went up to San Pedro de Atacama, which is at 8,000 feet. And yeah, but he didn't get up to 14 feet. Um, and yeah, the stars don't wrinkle up there. No, interesting. Yeah. So Dave Chapman tells me, I asked him, how many stars could you see in the Pleiades? And he said, we were there at the wrong time. We were, we were there in April. Yeah, so we anyway. <laughs> no, I know, that was, I was hoping it was going to be easy. Um, Chris I, has a role. One, as a one, one other. East. Yeah, so once, you know, once, Brass gets to hold of you. They never let you go. Um, I'm the chair for the Nova East Committee, and I'm looking for some volunteers to assist with it. Um, uh, Mary Lou has been chair for several years. Mary Lou, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the oxygen, the lack of oxygen in here. Um, <laughs> anyway, Judy um, has been has been chair for several years, and. Um, so this is this is the binder of the of the minutes and everything is planned out. We essentially have a checklist on what we do and what date and what what decisions need to be made and everything. It's pretty straightforward. There won't be very many meetings. They'll they'll probably be on Zoom, so it'll be convenient. Um, Dave Chapman, who's a, a long uh, has quite a lot of experience with that committee, uh, will be on on the committee and uh, the treasurer is on the committee. Uh, who keeps an eye on the money we spend, the prizes. Yes, yes, surprise. Anyway, and 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 signs off on on what the uh, what you know on how many how much money can be spent on the prizes. Um, so we need somebody to buy prizes this year, um, which is actually a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, um, if anybody has an interest in being on the committee, um, and you probably know if you've been to Nova East, 
that were kind of present there. And we kind of make sure that things run smoothly, but it's pretty much pretty fun. I'm just going to read the mission statement. So the Nova East Star Party mission is to celebrate and share common interests in astronomy and nature with observing opportunities, educational talks, seminars, social and outright reach activities for RASC members, their families, guests, and visitors of all ages through a camping weekend. So, and that's that's essentially what we do. Last year it was, we did, we, uh, because of COVID, we backed away from our contact with the public and trying to promote that. And we got a little bit back to where the roots of Nova East came from, which was, it was a, essentially a camping weekend where we got to share observing and then, but at the same time, we kind of opened up so that if there were other campers there, they get to share a little bit in our activities. So anyway, if you are interested, you could send me an email to my, my personal email address is cjy at eastlink.ca. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks again, Chris. Um, next up uh, is David Hoskin again, our, our uh, Education Public Outreach and our Observing Chair. And as you noted earlier with all the photos that were being taken, I'm hoping that David will be able to give us some good news as to what to look for that in, during the month of March uh, and hopefully take advantage of it, not only astro imaging, but also those of us like me who are visual observers and use our binoculars and telescopes to actually be out in the cold to observe. So, um, yep. So, David, uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Oh. Okay. All right. So, what's up in the March sky? Well, the sun's up. <laughs> And the sun's up for longer than uh, it has been uh, in the in uh, February. Um, so you'll probably notice the it stays late, light later. Um, dusk ends uh, just after seven thirty, um, start of the month, and by the end of the month uh, it'll be nine twenty one. So the day is definitely getting longer. The sunset at the uh, Are we good? Thank you. Okay. You didn't miss much. Okay. <laughs> we just we just were looking at the the uh the sun charts. Um so basically uh sunset's getting later, sunrise is uh um, also uh well make a mistake with that. No, maybe not. Oh of course, daylight saving time, yeah. That's right. The uh the dame. In fact, it should be well doesn't matter. I uh must have disappeared from the PowerPoint. Because there was a, a a note there about daylight savings time on March twelfth. Okay, so that's all you need to know. Um it's not clicking you highlight it. Oh, well, there's the LC this time and Equinox, March 20th. And so this, uh, this is what the sun looked like uh, this morning. Um, I downloaded, uh, took this image off spaceweather.com. And you might notice that um, sunspot uh, 3234 sunspot group is uh, rotating out of view. That is the spot that uh, was responsible for the uh, northern lights displays that uh, we didn't see uh, in Nova Scotia, I don't think. Uh, I saw Jeff and Jason were out taking pictures, and Jeff Donaldson got a bit of reddish in the, in the sky. I didn't see anything from Jason yet. Um, but uh, 
the sun's looking pretty spotty. There's some good, uh, good sized sunspots uh, rotating to view. And uh, this was uh, AR3234's way of saying goodbye. Uh, that's an X2 class solar flare. So if that had happened, it was pointing at us. Um, we definitely would have seen some northern lights. <laughs> Maybe lost some starlings too. <laughs> Yeah, we can always hope. Uh, so the moon this month, uh, full moon with March 7th, uh, maple sugar moon. Uh, and uh, moon's uh, near Antares on the 14th. Last quarter is the 15th. And the new moon on the 21st is birds laying eggs moon. Um, several planets are near the moon uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, Jupiter and Uranus on March 22nd and 24th. The moon is near the Pleiades on the 25th and uh, on the 29th is uh, near Pollux. And the 29th is also the first quarter of the uh, birds laying egg moon. So uh, a, a few things to look at or look for. Uh, on the 22nd, if the sky is clear, uh, look to the west and you'll see uh, the moon and Jupiter quite close together, pretty low on the horizon, so you'll need a, a good horizon. Uh, this is a good one. On the 24th, um, if you have those Celestron 15 by 70 binoculars, uh, the it's a good time to uh, to, to see uh, Uranus because it, it'll be easy to find. It'll be in the same field of view as the uh, um, thin crescent moon. And a uh, nice wide field uh, photo opportunity on the 25th. Um, Jupiter's sinking, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, just past 8.30. Jupiter's sinking uh, rapidly uh, in, uh, into the twilight, uh, disappearing below the Western horizon. But the Venus, Moon, and Pleiades uh, pretty much in, in a line. So that should, that should look pretty nice. Uh, best uh, times to uh, to look at the moon are around um, first quarter, uh, so the 28th to the 30th of uh, birds laying eggs moon. Um, if you're an early riser, the, the last quarter is also a good time, but you need to get up at four. Uh, but anyway, the both first and last quarter are good times to uh, um, pick out the uh, the, the different mare and the creatures that uh, you need to identify for uh, explore the universe and also uh, explore programs. Uh, the Lunar X, uh, March 29th at 12.59 uh, a.m. So you have to stay late. But you can find the X and the V. Uh, the planets, uh, Mercury's coming back. Uh, it returns by the end of March to the evening sky. Uh, Venus is still prominent in the western evening sky, and it has a very close, it had a very close conjunction with Jupiter on March 1st, and most of us didn't see that. Uh, it was clouded out here. I think, uh, I think I saw something from New Brunswick. I think the, the clouds parted for some folks in New Brunswick, but uh, we didn't see anything. Uh, Mars is still uh, pretty uh, bright and high in the sky. Uh, it's it's uh, in the vicinity of the winter stars of the winter hexagon. Uh, its uh, brightness continues to fade uh, as the month goes by and we get farther and farther from opposition. Uh, Jupiter is uh, visible, but it's low in the early evening sky. And by the end of the month, it'll be very difficult to see. Um, I mentioned a close conjunction with Venus on the 1st, which happened, and it's close to the thin crescent moon on the 22nd. Uh, Saturn is coming back. By month's end, uh, we'll see it in the morning twilight. Uh, and Uranus is still visible in the evening sky, but by the end of the month, it's getting close to the western horizon. And Neptune is too close to the sun to be seen this month. So this is what we, we missed, the spooky eyes. So the close conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. Um, really looking forward to that, but wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so we'll get another shot. 
and there'll be another conjunction in a few a year or two. Uh, this is a uh, this is a fun one. Um, bit of a challenge actually uh, on the thirtieth. If you have those fifteen by seventy binoculars, uh, Venus and Uranus will be in the same field of view, and and uh, of course Venus is very much brighter than than Uranus. So uh, if you're taking pictures of this, that that would be a bit of a challenge. Probably need a couple exposures. Uh, zodiacal light. This is the time to uh, look for zodiacal light. Uh, February and March, uh, when there's uh, no moon in the sky, you need a dark observing uh, site, and uh, you'll you'll see just after sunset uh, a, a glowing a pyramid um, reaching up along the ecliptic uh, due to the uh, dust that's con concentrated in the plane of the ecliptic, uh, reflecting uh, sunlight from the uh, the sun, which is now below the horizon. And um, I think most recent uh, evidence is that the dust is believed to come from Mars. Um, not really clear how it got from the Martian atmosphere to uh, <laughs> into the ecliptic of, of the uh, plane of the solar system, but that's the current, uh, current theory. Uh, explore the universe spring constellations. Uh, so last month we were, we, uh, we're looking at winter constellations. Now we're looking at the uh, uh, spring constellations uh, around the North Star. So Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, Botes, Leo, Virgo, and Libra. I just point out that it's uh, galaxy season. So lots of galaxies in Leo and, and Virgo, um, which is, are part of the, uh, the uh, Messier list if you're working on completing that. Spring stars, uh, Arcturus uh, is the brightest of them, uh, followed by Spica, Regulus, Duve, and Polaris. Um, those stars are all found in the uh, spring constellations. And deep sky objects uh, in the Explore the Universe program, uh, Messier 44, uh, a lot, uh, 111 and Messier 5. Uh, so Messier 44 is your challenge for this month. It's the Beehive Cluster. Uh, look uh, halfway between Castor and Pollux and Regulus. Uh, and uh, it's a very nice sight in binoculars. And uh, for, for I couldn't figure out for years why it was called the Beehive Cluster. I thought it, it was supposed to look like a swarm of bees, but actually it has the shape of an old-fashioned beehive. I, I thought it was a swarm of bees at first. But I was wrong. <laughs> uh, double and multiple stars. Um, this is an, an easy one. You you need to um, easy one to find at least. Uh, you need to stay up fairly late uh, for the head of the dragon to, to ro rotating around Polaris. So you need to wait for it to uh, get well above the uh, the northeastern horizon but the um, this the circled star in the head of the dragon is new draconis and it's a, uh, a, a double star uh, both stars have the equivalent magnitude uh, it's uh, i don't think you could split it easily in in uh, binoculars on uh, maybe perhaps with binoculars on a tripod but with a telescope uh, you could split them and uh, that's what it should look like. And the other thing uh, that's coming up, uh, not only is it uh, zodiacal light time, but it's also time for the Messier Marathon. Uh, so if you don't need sleep, uh, in, uh, you can, around the 22nd, 23rd uh, of the month, uh, you start off at uh, sunset uh, with uh, Messier 77. No, that's the other way around. You start at sunset with Messier 30. Uh, no, oh, I've got the dates mixed up on this for sure. Anyway, <laughs> yes, you end with uh, 30 and you start with 77. Well, yeah, not seeing 30. Yeah, well, look how close it is to the to the horizon. <laughs> so. I guess if you were on a boat sitting in the Atlantic, it'd be a good time to, to see it. <laughs> uh, 
And all these targets, uh, yeah, from a dark site, you should be able to see them with the uh, binoculars. And uh, that's it uh, for what's up in March. No questions? It's up on the RAS site if you need to uh, have, have another look. Questions from the room for David before we go to the Zoom land? Okay, no questions here. And there's, uh, who is it that is asking a question? Is there someone from Zoomland that wants a question? Okay, thanks so much, David. You gave us lots to think about uh, over the coming month. And um, for those of us that are into the Messier catalog uh, and have some some groups that are, or some Messier objects that are missing, that'll be a good opportunity to do it this coming month, I guess. Last but not least on our agenda is Pat Kelly. And Pat is the vice president of our center. And he will be presenting news from the board in his board notes. So Pat, take it away. Okay, just hang on here while I find the right window. There we go. Right, share and play. Okay, um, lots of stars this time around. So. Uh, might as well get right to it. We'll start off with the uh, uh, governance. Um, we had to make a new appointment. Uh, I'd like to thank Jamie uh, Wynott for uh, offering as treasurer, but uh, in the end, uh, it, it didn't quite work out all that well. So, uh, so she had to step down, or it, yeah, Jamie had to step down from the position. And uh, fortunately, Dave Lane has stepped in as the new treasurer just to fill out the one-year term, not the full five-year term that's available for treasurer. And Dave's done that before, so I think we should be good hands with that. Uh, the other two items under governance was we approved updated policies, uh, the G3 policy on bank signing. That basically uh, gives us an extra director in case we need to actually assign somebody else to, uh, to actually physically sign checks because with the board now being able to come from even outside of the province, as our new president is, uh, we thought it would actually be helpful to actually have somebody local that was actually on the board in case we needed somebody to pinch hit for actually signing uh, visual checks. And we uh, standardized some web operations. Uh, they both been posted. I would wait till the movies come out. They were posted for 24 hours when I had both James Cameron and Peter Jackson looking for the movie rights to them. And in fact, Peter Jackson's sure he can take the website operations one and stretch it out into a trilogy. So you can read them if you want. I would wait for the movie version of it. Uh, stuff to buy. We do still have some uh, calendars left. Uh, and you can e-transfer to treasure at halifax.resc.ca. Um, that $25 includes the shipping cost as well. So just make sure if you do by e-transfer that you actually uh, state how many calendars you want and make sure you include a mailing address so that we will know where to mail it. You can also mail a check as well uh, to our post office box. And if you're in the room, supposedly they have some for sale actually in the room itself. Green laser pointer training. It is coming very soon. Uh, we are going to have a session uh, with Dennis Lyons from the Winnipeg Center. And basically what's going to happen is he's going to train a bunch of people. It's about an hour and a half for the course. Uh, and then once we are trained, those people that have been trained will then be able to offer sessions to train other people. So this it will apply. It will give you training both if you're actually using a green laser pointer or if you're one of the people and you're required to have one person keeping an eye open for airplanes coming into the possible uh, field of view where the green laser pointers are being used. Those people will also have to be trained. And once you get your training, you, there's apparently a little exam that you have to fill out at the end to make sure you actually understand things. Your training is then good for three years. And uh, we will be keeping track of that internally in the center. So we'll sort of be keeping an eye on who needs to get their training refreshed. But uh, the first of those sessions is coming up in, in early March. On to center stars. Like I said, we've got a lot of them this time around. Uh, first up, Dave Lane and Tony McGraw. Uh, the reason for that is we now have electric heat out at the Zancroy Observatory. 
So for those of you who remember the propane system, uh, trying to get it to work at times was sort of like trying to hand crank a car to get it started. Now that we've got a new electric system, all you really have to do is throw the switch and you're going to have heat in the warm room at the observatory. And the, uh, the energy for that comes from the, uh, the dam that's, uh, that's further upstream from where the actual observatory is located. So we're now fully electrified. Second up for center stars, David Hoskin. And he is up because one of his images was used on CTV Atlantic News. This is the image here, uh, when they were having a discussion about Comet ZTF and uh, how rare it is to have a comet that comes in that is sort of greenish in color. Uh, at least it's green when you take a photograph of it. Um, so it was great that uh, we had one of our members was actually uh, on the local news to, uh, to do some visual uh, graphic support. Center stars number three, Tim Doucette and the Deep Sky Eye Observatory uh, down the southwestern part of the province. Uh, the reason is back in the fall, Eastlink filmed a session for their Wild Nova Scotia series down at the actual observatory. And I led to believe it's going to be on the Eastlink Community Network this coming Sunday, which is tomorrow at 3 p.m. And it's Eastlink Community Channels 10 and 600 and something, which I can't quite see because my participants list is blocking the view. But you can read, I think it is 610. And I suspect uh, the Wild Nova Scotia series, I think it cycles through the different shows. So if you do miss it, uh, it will most likely come back again in, as, as, they, um, as they sort of roll them over. Next center stars, Jennifer and John Reed. You may recall they actually gave a talk uh, to our center uh, some time back on a new book that they had written together called 50 Animals That Had Been to Space. Uh, lots of animals that I didn't even know had actually gone into space, but they had lots of different types. And that book has just won an award. So they've been given uh, the Gold Standard Selection Award by the Junior Library Guild. And apparently it's a, quite a prestigious award. And their book is now uh, on that list and will no doubt get a lot more publicity and a lot more sales and a lot more kids interested in science because one of the main ways to get kids interested in space science is through animals. Everybody likes animals. Next up for center stars, number five, Jerry Black. Now you've already seen this image um, of tadpoles and the flame nebula. Uh, and it, that image is now uh, the masthead for the Astronomy Nova Scotia website. So the tadpole galaxies are, if you can see the cursor, these are the tadpole galaxies here, and this is the um, flaming star nebula over here on the right-hand side, the right-hand side of it. I think when we were going through the pictures at the start of the, uh, at the meeting, it, there was sort of a crop of each one of them, but together uh, they're on the Nova Scotia, Astronomy Nova Scotia masthead. Star number six, Dave Lane. And that's for a paper that's being uh, published on uh, BL Lacerte, which is an active galactic nuclei or nucleus. This is a galaxy that uh, has very fast bright changes in its brightness. Uh, and this is the top of the abstract. And just in case you're wondering where is Dave in that entire list, uh, he's right there, DJ Lane. Uh, the principal investigators used hundreds of images taken by his Abbey Ridge Observatory to actually uh, produce uh, a lot of the data that was being used in the paper. And it, I, it's funny because I still remember when I was actually taking, uh, taking graduate courses uh, in physics, there was a standing joke that when it came to, uh, to the authorship of papers, they really needed to, uh, to fit what was known as the Volkswagen principle. And that was if you couldn't fit all the authors into a Volkswagen, there were probably so many people involved that no one person has actually thought the entire thing through from beginning to end. But in modern day science, uh, there's so much collaboration done that I don't think the Volkswagen principle applies too much anymore. But uh, it's, it's still in the peer review process, but like most uh, papers these days, it's, it's already been e-published and uh, it will eventually be uh, printed published. Center star number seven, 
David Hoskin, yet again. He's, he had a letter to the editor and an image in the Sky News that just came out. And as we now know, that's probably gonna be the very last issue of Sky News, uh, but he had a photograph uh, and a letter and the photograph is of NGC 2169. So he came into, uh, uh, as a response to Chris Vaughn's article on Beyond the Messier List and all the other nice things you can actually see with the telescope that are a little bit less known, but still uh, quite worthy of taking a look at. So he's been published in Sky News. And I think center star number eight is Lisa Ann Fanning. And she had an image in Earth Sky News. She took it back in February. And this is Jupiter and Venus. And this was taken, uh, like I said, in February. Uh, but on a personal note, this was taken from Cape May, New Jersey. And for those of you who are into birding, you may be familiar with a warbler called the Cape May Warbler. Uh, it's one of a large number of warblers that are improperly named uh, because they don't breed in the area where they're named after. So there's Connecticut warblers and Tennessee warblers and Kentucky warblers. There's pine warblers and there's palm warblers. And a lot of those warblers uh, were named back when they were collected back in the early 1800s. And by collected, I mean shot out of a tree with a shotgun and see if anything different shows up. And generally they were named after where they were first discovered. So for example, Connecticut warblers were first discovered in Connecticut, but it's only because they fly through there on their way to breeding up in the boreal forest. So you don't actually find a lot of these birds actually breeding in the place after which they're actually named, which I always thought was kind of funny. Lisa Ann's photo, that particular one, was actually posted twice in Earth Sky News. It was posted again on March 3rd. Oh, oh, excellent. So for upcoming events, uh, for members meetings, uh, we have uh, the next meetings on April Fool's Day. Uh, the main meeting has been changed because the RESC's General Assembly this year is being held virtually, and it's being held on, that, on the weekend of the 5th to the 7th. So since it's going to be done via Zoom and there'll be papers and presentations uh, on the same day, we moved our meeting back one week or ahead, ahead or back. I'm never sure which, which way people meet it. Anyways, it's been moved to the 13th. Uh, our me next meeting after that is on June the 3rd. And this year, the RESC is splitting the General Assembly from the annual general meeting. So the annual general meeting is going to be at 3 o'clock on uh, on June the 25th, and there'll be more publicity about those um, forthcoming, at least one hopes. Uh, and then I just decided to note that September 9th is the first uh, meeting back after the break for summer, and it's not the Labor Day weekend. And in terms of events that we have coming up, we have the uh, Kedron Kujik Dark Sky weekend, uh, the nights of August. I'm gonna see if I can turn off this part uh, because uh, it's, it's annoying. Pat, yeah. if you can be a little more descriptive than usual, um, <laughs> our projector here decided to time out after three hours on, so we're just in the process of getting it turned back on. So we can't, we see a black screen, but you're always very descriptive, so I don't think we'll miss too much. <laughs> well, I'm going to be even more descriptive if I can't get this chat window to the way so I can actually see what I'm doing. Oh, there we go. I got most of it gone and all of it gone. Well, most of it gone. <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the dates, all you need to do is write this down on, uh, on, uh, on your shirt sleeve or on your, the back of your hand. Uh, it's not until August anyway, so there'll be plenty and plenty of, of warning. Uh, but uh, it, Pat, it, the, uh, the Dark Sky Weekend is August the 11th to the 13th, so not for several months coming up. Uh, and then it's going to be quickly followed by the 2023 Nova East which is going to be the nights of August the 18th to the 20th. And the new moon is on the 16th. So it, as usual, we try to get a nice thin crescent moon up in the sky um, for the nights. So that way it's out of the way. And for those who like to see nice dark sky things, uh, there's no full moon to really bugger things up. So uh, that's Nova East. And the last event I have on here is not coming up. Why is it not coming up? Oh, there we go. Uh, is the annual St. Croix barbecue. Again, you got lots and lots of time for it. It's not gonna be until Friday, September the 15th. So after the Christmas break or after the summer break, 
And the rain day for that is the 16th, which is the following Saturday. And if both days are rained out, we'll just push it back <laughs> to some date further in the future. And that's and I think that is it. Okay. Yep, there we go. Thank you so much, Pat. Any questions in the room for Pat regarding anything that he brought our attention to? I should point out I have a couple of uh, people uh, who shall rename nameless at them uh, who feed me information whenever they see stuff that center members have done. So if you see something either in print or on or on media anywhere uh, where somebody from the center has actually done something that's uh, that's gotten a lot of publicity, uh, just let me know and I'll include them in the list of stars for the next presentation. Okay, thanks again, Pat. Um, I'm just going to reiterate something that Pat had mentioned about the calendars. We still have some available for sale. They are $25, as he noted, and the mechanism for um, acquiring one he has uh, uh, told you about. But also we have copies of the Explore the Universe 3rd edition. So if new members have not acquired their copies or current members would like one to send off to a friend to get them interested in astronomy, please contact me and uh, we'll send them out to you. These are, the ETUs are $20 and that includes your postage. So it's a good deal. Um, on, on an end note, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out, both here in the room, as well as those of you out in Zoomland. I'd also like to thank St. Mary's University for, for providing this space to us uh, at no charge. It's been a, a godsend and it certainly is uh, an easily accessible space for us to utilize. I want to thank both our speakers today, Stefan Picard and Chris Young. Um, fascinating topics, both of them. And so thank you so much. And uh, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for our three IT guys, um, Dave Lane, Bob Russell, and Jerry Black. So thanks very much to them as well for this. And as Pat noted, our next meeting is April 1st. And we're not joking. It really is April 1st. So we'll see you then. And until then, keep looking up, the sky is open, fingers crossed.